Chapter One of the Tower Treasure. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Samuel D. Graham. The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. The Speed Demon. After the help we gave Dad on that forgery case, I guess he'll begin to think we could be detectives when we grow up. Why shouldn't we? Isn't he one of the most famous detectives in the country? And aren't we his sons? If the profession was good enough for him to follow, it should be good enough for us. Two bright-eyed boys on motorcycles were speeding along a shore road in the sunshine of a morning in spring. It was Saturday, and they were enjoying a holiday from the Bayport High School. The day was ideal for a motorcycle trip, and the lads were combining business with pleasure by going on an errand to a nearby village for their father. The older of the two boys was a tall, dark youth, about sixteen years of age. His name was Frank Hardy. The other boy, his companion on the motorcycle trip, was his brother Joe, a year younger. While there was a certain resemblance between the two lads, chiefly in the firm yet good-humored expression of their mouths, in some respects they differed greatly in appearance. While Frank was dark, with straight black hair and brown eyes, his brother was pink-cheeked, with fair, curly hair and blue eyes. These were the Hardy Boys, sons of Fenton Hardy, an internationally famous detective who had made a name for himself in the years he had spent on the New York police force, and who was now, at the age of forty, handling his own practice. The Hardy family lived in Bayport, a city of about 50,000 inhabitants, located on Barmet Bay, three miles in from the Atlantic, and here the Hardy Boys attended high school and dreamed of the days when they, too, should be detectives like their father. As they sped along the narrow shore road, with the waves breaking on the rocks far below, they discussed their chances of winning over their parents to agreement with their ambition to follow in the footsteps of their father. Like most boys, they speculated frequently on the occupation they should follow when they grew up, and it had always seemed to them that nothing offered so many possibilities of adventure and excitement as the career of a detective. But whenever we mention it to Dad, he just laughs at us, said Joe Hardy, tells us to wait until we're through school, and then we can think about being detectives. Well, at least he's more encouraging than Mother, remarked Frank. She comes out plump and plain and says she wants one of us to be a doctor and the other a lawyer. What a fine lawyer either one of us would make, sniffed Joe. Or a doctor, either. We were both cut out to be detectives, and Dad knows it. As I was saying, the help we gave him in that forgery case proves it. He didn't say much, but I'll bet he's been thinking a lot. Of course, we didn't actually do very much in that case, Joe pointed out. But we suggested something that led to a clue, didn't we? That's as much a part of detective work as anything else. Dad himself admitted he would never have thought of examining the city tax receipts for that forged signature. It was just a lucky idea on our part, but it proved to him that we can use our heads for something more than to hang our hats on. Oh, I guess he's convinced all right. Once we get out of school, he'll probably give his permission. Why, this is a good sign right now, isn't it? He asked us to deliver these papers for him in Willowville. He's letting us help him. I'd rather get in on a real good mystery, said Frank. It's all right to help Dad, but if there's no more excitement in it than delivering papers, I'd rather start in studying to be a lawyer and be done with it. Never mind, Frank, comforted his brother. We may get a mystery all of our own to solve some day. If we do, we'll show that Fenton Hardy's sons are worthy of his name. Oh, boy, but what wouldn't I give to be as famous as Dad? Why, some of the biggest cases in the country are turned over to him. That forgery case, for instance. Fifty thousand dollars had been stolen right from under the noses of the city officials, and all the auditors and city detectives and private detectives they called in had to admit that it was too deep for them. Then they called in Dad, and he cleared it up in three days. 
Once he got suspicious of that slick bookkeeper whom nobody had been suspecting at all, it was all over but the shouting. Got a confession out of him and everything. It was smooth work. I'm glad our suggestion helped him. The case certainly got a lot of attention in the papers. And here we are, said Joe, plugging along the shore road on a measly little errand to deliver some legal papers at Willowville. I'd rather be on the track of some diamond thieves or smugglers or something. Well, we have to be satisfied, I suppose, replied Frank, leaning farther over the handlebars. Perhaps Dad may give us a chance on a real case sometime. Sometime? I want to be on a real case now. The motorcycles roared along the narrow road that skirted the bay. An embankment of tumbled rocks and boulders sloped steeply to the water below, and on the other side of the road was a steep cliff. The roadway itself was narrow, although it was wide enough to permit two cars to meet and pass, and it wound about in frequent curves and turnings. It was a road that was not often traveled, for Willowville was only a small village, and this shore road was an offshoot of the main highways to the north and the west. The Hardy boys dropped their discussion of the probability that some day they would become detectives, and for a while they rode on in silence, occupied with the difficulties of keeping to the road. For the road at this point was dangerous, very rough and ruddy, and it sloped sharply upward so that the embankment leading to the ocean far below became steeper and steeper. I shouldn't want to go over the edge around here, remarked Frank as he glanced down the rugged slope. It's a hundred foot drop. You'd be smashed to pieces before you ever hit the shore. I'll say, it's best to stay in close to the cliff. These curves are bad medicine. The motorcycles took the next curve neatly, and then the boys confronted a long, steep slope. The rocky cliffs frowned on one side, and the embankment jutted far down to the tumbling waves below, so that the road was a mere ribbon before them. Once we get to the top of the hill, we'll be all right. It's all smooth sailing from there to Willowville, remarked Frank as the motorcycles commenced the climb. Just then, above the sharp putt-putt of their own motors, they heard the high humming roar of an automobile approaching at great speed. The car was not yet in sight, but there was no mistaking the fact that it was coursing along with the cutout open and with no regard for the speed laws. "'What idiot is driving like that on this kind of road?' exclaimed Frank. They looked back. Even as he spoke, the automobile flashed into sight. It came around the curve behind, and so swiftly did the driver take the dangerous turn that two wheels were off the ground as the car shot into view. A cloud of dust and stones arose. The car veered violently from left to right, and then it roared at headlong speed down the slope. The boys glimpsed a tense figure at the wheel. How he kept the car on the road was a miracle, for the racing automobile swung from side to side. At one moment it would be in imminent danger of crashing over the embankment, down on the rocks below. The next instant the car would be over on the other side of the road, grazing the cliff. "'He'll run us down!' shouted Joe in alarm. "'The idiot!' Indeed, the position of the two lads was perilous. The roadway was narrow enough at any time, and this speeding car was taking up every inch of space. In a great cloud of dust, it bore directly down on the two motorcyclists. It seemed to leap through the air. The front wheels left a rut. The rear of the car skidded violently about. By a twist of the wheel, the driver pulled the car back into the roadway again, just as it seemed about to plunge over the embankment. It shot over toward the cliff, swerved back again into the middle of the roadway, and then shot ahead at terrific speed. Frank and Joe edged their motorcycles as far to the right of the road as they dared. To their horror, they saw that the car was skidding again. The driver made no attempt to slacken speed. The automobile came hurtling toward them. End of chapter one.
Chapter Two of the Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Samuel D. Graham. The Stolen Roadster. The auto brakes squealed. The driver of the oncoming car swung the wheel viciously about. For a moment, it appeared that the wheels would not respond. Then they gripped to the gravel, and the automobile swerved, then shot past. Bits of sand and gravel were flung about the two boys as they crouched by their motorcycles at the edge of the embankment. The car had missed them only by inches. Frank caught a glimpse of the driver, who turned about at that moment, and, in spite of the speed at which the automobile was traveling, and in spite of the perils of the road, shouted something they could not catch at them, and shook his fist. The car was traveling at too great a speed to enable the lad to distinguish the driver's features, but he saw that the man was hatless, and that he had a shock of red hair blowing in the wind. Then the automobile disappeared from sight around the curve ahead, roaring away in a cloud of dust. "'The road hog!' gasped Joe, as soon as he had recovered from his surprise. "'He must be crazy!' Frank exclaimed angrily. "'Why, he might have pushed us both right over the embankment. At the rate he was going, I don't think he cared whether he ran anyone down or not.' Both boys were justifiably angry. On such a narrow, treacherous road there was danger enough when an automobile passed them traveling at even a reasonable speed, but the reckless and insane driving of the red-headed motorist was nothing short of criminal. "'If we ever catch up to him, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind,' declared Frank. Not content with almost running us down, he had to shake his fist at us. "'Road hog,' muttered Joe again. Jail is too good for the likes of him. If it was only his own life he endangered, it wouldn't be so bad. Good thing we only had motorcycles. If we had been in another car, there would have been a smash-up, sure. The boys resumed their journey, and by the time they had reached the curve ahead that enabled them to see the village of Willowville lying in a little valley along the bay beneath them, there was no trace of the reckless motorist. Frank delivered the legal papers his father had given to him, and then the boys had the rest of the day to themselves. "'It's too early to go back to Bayport just now,' he said to Joe. "'What say we go out and visit Chet Morton?' "'Good idea,' agreed Joe. "'He has often asked us to come out and see him.' Chet Morton was a school chum of the Hardy Boys. His father was a real estate dealer with an office in Bayport, but the family lived in the country, about a mile from the city. Although Willowville was some distance away, the boys knew of a road that would take them across the country to the Morton home, and from there they could return to Bayport. It would make their journey longer, but they would have the pleasure of visiting their chum. Chet was a great favorite with all the boys, not the least of the reasons for his popularity being the fact that he had a roadster of his own, in which he drove to school every day, and with which he was very generous in giving rides to his friends after school hours. The Hardy Boys drove along the country roads in the spring sunlight, enjoying the freedom of their holiday as only boys can. When they had reached a culvert not far from the Morton place, Frank suddenly brought his motorcycle to a stop and peered down into a clump of bushes in the deep ditch. "'Somebody's had a spill,' he remarked. Down in the bushes lay an upturned automobile. The car was a total wreck and lay bottom upward, a mass of tangled junk. "'Must have been hitting an awful clip to crumple up like that,' Joe commented. Perhaps there's someone underneath. Let's go and see. The boys left their motorcycles by the road and went down to the wrecked car. But there was no sign of either driver or passengers. If anyone was hurt, they've been taken away by now. Probably this wreck is a day or so old, said Frank. Let's go. We can't do any good here. They left the wreckage and returned to the road again, resuming their journey. I thought at first it might be our red-headed speed fiend, said Frank. If it was, he was sure lucky to get out of it alive. The boys gave little further thought to the incident, and before long they were in sight of the Morton's house, a big, home-like, rambling old farmhouse with an apple orchard at the rear. 
When the boys drove down the lane, they saw a figure awaiting them at the barnyard gate. That's Chet, said Frank. I'm glad we found him at home. I thought he might have gone out in the car. It is strange, Joe agreed. On a holiday like this, he doesn't usually stay around the farm. As they approached, they saw Chet leave the gate and come down the lane to meet them. Chet was one of the most popular boys at the Bayport High School, one reason for his popularity being his unfailing good nature and his ability to see fun in almost everything. He was full of jokes and good humor and was rarely seen without a smile on his plump, freckled face. But today, the Hardy Boys saw that there was something wrong. Chet's face had an anxious expression, and as they brought their motorcycles to a stop, they saw that their chum's usually cheery face was clouded. "'What's the matter?' asked Frank, as their friend hastened up to them. "'You're just in time,' replied Chet hurriedly. "'You didn't meet a fellow driving my roadster, did you?' The brothers looked at each other blankly. "'Your roadster? We'd recognize it anywhere. No, we didn't see it,' said Joe. "'What's happened?' It's been stolen. Stolen? An auto thief stole it from the garage not a half an hour ago. He went in just as cool as you please and made away with the car. The hired man saw the roadster disappearing down the lane, but he supposed I was in it so he didn't think anything of it. Then he saw me out in the yard a little while later, so he got suspicious. And the roadster was gone. Wasn't it locked? That's the strange part of it. The car was locked, although the garage door was open. I can't see how he got away with it. A professional job, commented Frank. These auto thieves always carry scores of keys with them. But we're losing time here. The only thing is to set out in pursuit and to notify the police. The hired man didn't see which way the fellow went, did he? No. There is only the one road, and we didn't meet him, so he must have taken the turning to the right at the end of the lane. We'll chase him, said Joe. Climb onto my bike, Chet. We'll get the thief yet. Wait a minute, cried Frank suddenly. I have an idea. Joe, do you remember that car we saw wrecked in the bushes? Sure. Perhaps the driver stole the first automobile he could lay his hands on after the wreck. What wreck was that? asked Chet. The Hardy Boys told him of the wrecked car they had found by the roadside. It had occurred to Frank that perhaps the smash-up might have occurred just a short while before, and that the driver of the wrecked car had resumed his interrupted journey in a stolen automobile. It sounds reasonable, said Chet. Let's go and take a look at this wreck. We can get the license number, and that may help us find the name of the owner. The motorcycles roared as the three chums set out back along the road toward the place where the upturned automobile had been seen among the bushes. The boys lost no time in reaching the place, for they realized that every second was precious, and that the longer they delayed, the greater was the advantage to the car thief. The car had not been disturbed, and apparently no one had been near it since the boys had discovered the wreck. They parked their motorcycles by the roadside, and again went down into the bushes to examine the wrecked car. To their disappointment, the car bore no license plates. "'That looks suspicious,' said Frank. "'It's more than suspicious,' said Joe, who had withdrawn a little to one side and was examining the automobile from the rear. "'Don't you remember seeing this car before, Frank? It didn't occur to me until you mentioned the matter of license plates.' I have been wondering if this isn't the same car that passed us on the shore road at the curve, replied Frank slowly. It is the same car. There's no doubt of it in my mind. It didn't have a license plate, I noticed at the time, for I wanted to get the fellow's number. And it was a touring car of the same make as this. You're right, Joe. There's no mistake. The red-headed driver came to grief in the ditch, just as we said he would, and then he went on to the nearest farmhouse, which happened to be Chet's place, and stole the first car he saw. The busted car was the one the fellow was running who nearly sent us over the cliff, Joe declared. And it's ten chances to one that he's the fellow who stole Chet's roadster. And he's red-headed. We have those clues anyway. 
"'And he went on past our farmhouse instead of turning back the way he came,' cried Chet. "'Come on, fellas, let's get after him. "'There was only a little bit of gas in the roadster anyway. "'Perhaps he's stalled by this time.' Thrilling with the excitement of a chase, the boys clambered back onto the motorcycles, and within a few moments a cloud of dust rose from the road as the Hardy Boys and Chet Morton set out in swift pursuit of the red-headed automobile thief. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Samuel D. Graham. Traces of the Thief Chet Morton's roadster was a brilliant yellow, not easily mistaken, and the Hardy Boys were confident that it would not be difficult to pick up the trail of the auto thief. The car is pretty well known around Bayport, said Chet. It was certainly a gay-looking speed wagon. Anyone who saw it would remember it. Seems strange that a thief would take a car like that, remarked Frank. Auto thieves usually take cars of a standard make and standard color. They're easier to get rid of. He would know that a car like yours could be easily traced. I don't think he stole the car to sell it, Joe pointed out. Take it from me, that chap was getting away from some place in a hurry, and when his own car was smashed, he just took the first one that came to hand. If we keep after him before he has a chance to get rid of it, we'll run him to earth. A number of men in a hayfield nearby attracted Frank's attention, and he brought his motorcycle to a stop. I'm going to ask these chaps if they saw him pass. Frank scrambled over the fence and went over to talk to the farmhands, who watched his approach with curiosity. Didn't see a yellow roadster pass here within the last hour, did you? One of them, a lanky old farmer with a sunburned nose, carefully laid down his scythe, put his hand to his ears, and shouted, Eh? Did you see a fellow pass along here in a roadster? Frank repeated in a louder tone. The farmer turned to his companions, removed a plug of tobacco from the pocket of his overalls, and took a hearty chew. Lad here want to know if we saw a roadster come by here he said slowly. There were three other farmhands, and all gathered around. They put down their scythes very deliberately, and the plug of tobacco was duly passed around the group. Frank waited. A roadster, eh? asked one. A yellow roadster, Frank told him. One of the men removed his hat and mopped his brow. Seems to me, he observed, I did see a car come by here a while ago. A yellow car? No, twasn't a yellow car. It was a delivery truck, if I remember rightly. Frank strove to conceal his impatience. It was a roadster I was asking about. A yellow roadster. Not one of them there coops, hey? Asked the oldest man in the group doubtfully. No, not a coop. A roadster. Roadster, eh? Remarked the old farmer. That's one of them there automobiles with just two seats and a little cupboard in the back, eh? My cousin has one, observed another member of the group. He got it second hand in Bayport. I never could see why he bought the doggone thing, for you can't take the folks out for a ride in it without having them all crowded something fearful. Give me the old touring car every time. Can't say as I agree with you, returned the old farmer. What good's a touring car if you want to haul a load of grain into town? Once of them leetle trucks is the best, I've always thought. Then, if you want to go on a picnic or anything, the family can all climb in the back. You get the use out of a car like that. Nope, nothing like a touring car. Rank extravagance buying touring cars, put in another. Horse and wagon is good enough for me. That's what I say, agreed the fourth. What with taxes the way they are, and last year's crops wasn't any too good. I tell ye, a touring car is the only thing nowadays. Somewhat astonished by the sudden turn the argument had taken, Frank vainly tried to make himself heard above the uproar. But what about this roadster, he asked. Did any of you see it? 
but the four men in the field were not listening. Instead, they were deep in a highly complicated argument regarding the faults and merits of various makes of cars, and they paid no further attention to the youth. "'Can't afford to waste any more time here,' he said to himself, and turned away. At the fence he looked back. One of the farmhands was shaking his fist beneath the nose of a companion, while the other two were engrossed in a heated discussion. Their voices floated across the hayfield in the drowsy summer morning. <laughs> "'It looks as if you started something,' laughed Joe as his brother returned to the motorcycle. "'I certainly did. Just asked them if they had seen a yellow roadster, and they started to fight about what was the best car for a farmer to buy.' "'And they didn't see the roadster?' asked Chet. I don't think so. If they had, they would have told me. I guess they were glad of an excuse to quit work. Well, we'd better be getting on our way, then. We've lost enough time already. So, while the four farmhands wrangled loudly in the field, in an argument that they'd fare to last until dinner time at least, the three boys set out again in pursuit of the red-headed auto thief. They were approaching Bayport when they saw a girl walking along the road ahead of them. There was something familiar about her appearance, and as they drew nearer, Frank's face lighted up, for he recognized the girl as Callie Shaw, who was in his own class at Bayport High School. Of all the girls at the school, Callie was the one most greatly admired by Frank. She was a pretty girl, with brown hair and brown eyes, always neatly dressed and quick and vivacious in her manner. As the boys brought their motorcycles to a stop, Frank saw that Callie was not in her usual bright and cheery humor. Under one arm she was carrying a parcel that had evidently become untied, and the paper of which was badly torn. Her face was distressed, and it appeared that she had been crying. Callie looked up, and recognizing the boys, ran over toward them. "'That awful man!' she wailed, even before they had time to ask her what the matter was. "'He ran right over my parcel and smashed nearly all the cakes and jelly I was bringing to Mrs. Wills.' And with that she held out the torn parcel. Frank knew that Callie, who was a generous and good-hearted girl, had been in the habit of taking little delicacies to a widow, Mrs. Wills, who lived just on the outskirts of Bayport. Now he saw that the parcel had been smashed so that only one glass of jelly and a few of the cakes had been left intact. "'What man, Callie?' he asked. "'What happened?' "'He ran right over my parcel!' Just then Callie spied Chet Morton. She pouted at him. "'He was a friend of yours, too, Chet Morton, for he was driving your car.' "'My car?' gasped Chet. "'Your yellow roadster.' He came driving along this road at such a terrible speed that I was frightened and dropped my parcel. Then he ran right over it. "'Why, Callie, that's just the fellow we've been looking for,' said Frank quickly. "'Chet's car has been stolen.' "'Well, whoever stole it came by here not ten minutes ago,' said the girl. "'And he's a madman, by the way he was driving.' "'Why, we're right on his trail, then,' declared Frank. "'He must have gone into Bayport.' He was heading that way, Callie told them, but at the rate he was going, he'll have a hard time catching him. Oh, Chet, I'm so sorry your car was stolen. Don't worry, we'll get it back, replied Chet grimly. Are you going back home, Callie? asked Frank. No, I'm going on up to Mrs. Will's place. You needn't bother to drive me up. It's only a few yards farther on. I know you're anxious to chase that awful man. We'll chase him all right, declared Frank, as the motorcycles roared. They bade goodbye to the girl and sped on their way into Bayport, leaving Callie to continue her journey to the home of Mrs. Wills with the remains of the cakes and jelly over which she had spent so much time and care. They sped down the main street of Bayport and headed directly to the police station, where they intended to report the theft of Chet's car and a description of the thief, assuming him to be the red-headed man who had so nearly run down Frank and Joe on the shore road. But when they reached the police station, a further surprise was in wait for them. End of chapter 3 
Chapter Four of the Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Samuel D. Graham. The Hold Up. Chief Ezra Colleg of the Bayport Police Force was a burly, red-faced individual, much given to telling long-winded stories. Usually, Colleg was to be found reclining in a swivel chair in his office, with his feet on the desk, reading the comic papers, or polishing up his numerous badges, but this day something had happened to shake him out of his customary calm. When the boys went into his office, they found the chief painfully writing in a huge notebook, and confronted by three excited figures. One of these was Ike Harrity, the old ticket seller at the city steamboat office. The others were Detective Smuff of the police force and Policeman Con Riley, both trying their best to look important and composed. Ike Harrity was frankly frightened. It was plain that something very much out of the ordinary had happened. Harrity was a timid and inoffensive old chap who had perched on a high stool behind the wicket at the steamboat office day in and day out for as many years as anyone in Bayport could remember. "'I was just counting up the morning's receipts,' he was saying in a frightened and high-pitched voice, "'when in comes this fellow and he sticks a revolver in front of my nose.' "'Just a minute,' interrupted the chief grandly as the boys entered. He dipped his pen in the inkwell and poised it in the air as he peered at the lads over his spectacles. "'What are you boys doing here? Can't you see we're busy?' "'I came to report a theft,' said Chet Morton. "'My roadster has been stolen.' "'Why, it was a roadster this fellow drove up to my office in!' cried Ike Harrity. "'A yellow roadster!' "'Ha!' said Detective Smuff. "'A clue!' He immediately fished a notebook out of his pocket and began rummaging around for a pencil. "'Never mind, Detective Smuff,' observed the chief heavily. "'I'll take any notes that are needed.' Detective Smuff, duly squelched, put back his notebook in confusion. "'What fellow?' Frank asked. "'Who drove up to your office in a yellow roadster?' "'The hold-up man,' declared Harrity. "'I was held up this morning.' The fellow tried to steal the steamboat money on me. Now just a minute, just a minute, demanded the chief. Let me say a word here. The situation is this. A man drove up to the steamboat office a little while ago and tried to hold up Mr. Harrity. But a passenger happened to come in the office just then, and the fellow got frightened and ran away. Is that right? That's right, said Harrity. I'll make a note of it, said the chief, suiting the action to the word. When he had scribbled industriously for some time, he raised the pen again and pointed it at Chet. Now you, he observed, say that somebody stole a yellow roadster on you this morning. Yes, sir, from our farm. He was seen driving into Bayport just a little while ago. The chief made a note of it. And you, he said, pointing the pen at Ike Harrity, say the hold-up man drove up to the office in a yellow roadster? That's right, chief, that's right. A yellow roadster it was. And now that I come to think of it, I've seen Chet Morton's car before, and it was the spitting image of it. Then, declared the chief, putting down his pen with the air of one making a momentous discovery, it looks to me very much as if the hold-up man and the fellow that stole the car is one and the same man. Detective Smuff wagged his head solemnly in admiration of this feat of deduction. I believe you're right, chief, he declared. Of course he's right, said Frank. It couldn't be anyone else. The point is this. Where did the hold-up man go? Did he leave in the car? Did anyone follow him? He left in the car, all right, said Harrity, but nobody followed him. I telephoned for the police. Did you notice the color of this man's hair? asked Frank suddenly. What's that got to do with it? asked Detective Smuff. Never mind. It may have a great deal to do with it. Did you notice the color of his hair? repeated Frank, turning to Harrity. It was short said Harrity firmly, short and dark. Frank and Joe looked blankly at one another. "'Are you sure?' asked Joe. 
I'm positive, declared Harity. I was face to face with him. He was a dark-haired man, and his hair was cut awful short. I noticed that. You're sure he wasn't red-headed? I'm sure of it. What's all this about? asked Chief Colleague suspiciously. What has the color of his hair to do with it? Well, admitted Frank, we were pretty sure that the man who stole Chet's car had long red hair. Hum, muttered the chief doubtfully. Then if that was the case, the man who stole the car and the man who tried to hold up the office isn't one and the same fellow after all. I don't know what to make of it, confessed Frank. Just then, a short, nervous little man was ushered into the office. He introduced himself as the passenger who had gone into the steamboat office at the time of the attempted hold-up, and he presented himself in answer to a call from the chief. In reply to questions, the newcomer, who gave the prosaic name of Henry J. Brown and said he was from New York, told of entering the office and seeing a man run away from the wicket with a revolver in his hand. "'What color was his hair? Did you notice?' asked Frank eagerly. "'I can't say I did,' answered the little man. "'It all happened so quickly I didn't realize that it was a hold-up until the man was out the door. Then I saw him jump into the roadster and drive away. But wait a minute. I did notice the color of his hair, just as the car was disappearing down the street. You couldn't help notice. He was red-headed. He had long red hair.' Detective Smuff looked blankly at the chief, and the chief looked blankly at everybody else, particularly at Henry J. Brown of New York. "'I knew it!' declared Joe exultantly. "'It's the same man!' "'It can't be the same man,' said the chief wearily. "'You boys don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Harrity says he had short, dark hair. Now how could he have short, dark hair and long, red hair at the same time? I ask you that!' How could he? Chief Colleague propounded this query with the expression of one who has triumphantly settled all difficulties. He had short, dark hair, said Harrity doggedly. And I'm sure he had long red hair, shouted Henry J. Brown very indignantly. Do you think I'm blind? Do you think I'd tell a lie about it? He had dark hair. It was red. It was dark. It wasn't. It was. Stop it, commanded Chief Colleague. I don't think either of you know what kind of hair he had. Probably he was bald-headed. But I'll send word out to keep a watch for the Yellow Roadster. I'll notify the police in other towns, too. I guess that's all that can be done now. And with that, the Hardy Boys and Chet Morton had to be content. When they left the office, it was with little hope that the thief or the car would be found. Their misgivings were justified. When they returned to see Chief Colleague that night, they learned that no word had been received concerning the Yellow Roadster from any of the outlying towns or villages, and that despite a diligent search conducted by Detective Smuff and other members of the Bayport Force, the Roadster had not been located in the city. End of Chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chet's Auto Horn Fenton Hardy, the internationally famous detective, was reading in the library of his home that evening when his sons tapped on the door. Although he was a busy man, Mr. Hardy was not the type of father who maintains an air of aloofness from his family the result being that he was on as good terms with his boys as though he were an elder brother. "'Come in!' he shouted cheerfully, putting aside his book, and when Frank and Joe entered the room, he motioned to a deep leather sofa near the window. "'Sit down. What have you been doing all day? Burning up all the roads in the country, I suppose?' He grinned amiably at them and puffed vigorously at his pipe. "'Well, we didn't travel very far today, Dad.' Frank replied. We were, well, we, we were investigating, prompted Joe. Aha! exclaimed Mr. Hardy in mock surprise. So my sons were investigating, eh? What was it? A murder? 
A plot to blow up the White House? A train wreck? Something big, I hope. No, not quite that bad, admitted Frank. It was a car theft. Mr. Hardy shook his head. I'm disappointed in you, he said solemnly. I really am. To think that sons of mine should investigate a car theft. I thought you wouldn't bother about anything less than a murder. His eyes twinkled, and the Hardy boys, who were accustomed to their father's good-natured banter, smiled back at him. "'We weren't just practicing detective work, Dad,' explained Frank. "'You see, Chet Morton's roadster was stolen this morning.' "'Is that so?' exclaimed Mr. Hardy, genuinely concerned. "'Why, that's too bad. Chet was mighty proud of that car, wasn't he?' "'Yes, he was.' and it hasn't been found yet. No trace of the thief? He tried to hold up the steamboat ticket office after he stole the car. Mr. Hardy whistled. Why, you have been on a case worthwhile. Tell me all about it. He settled back in his chair while his sons told him the story of the day's doings. When they told of the difference of opinion as to the color of the man's hair, he did not laugh with them, as they had expected, over the argument between Mr. Harrity and Mr. Brown. On the contrary, he knitted his brows, and his face wore a serious expression. "'It wasn't any ordinary auto thief you were dealing with,' he said slowly. I've no doubt the man who tried to rob the ticket office and the man who almost ran you down on the shore road were one and the same. And the same man stole Chet Morton's car. But how about the color of his hair? There must have been two men, said Joe. Think so? I have my own theories. But then, the average witness is very unreliable. For instance, I'll give you a test. You each have seen Superintendent Norton of Bayport High School, well, how often? About two or three thousand times, I guess, answered Frank. Over a period of three years. Well, what color is his hair? Frank looked blankly at Joe. Why, it's, it's... Joe scratched his head. Brown, isn't it? I think it's black. You see, said Mr. Hardy, smiling. Your powers of observation have not been trained. A good detective has to school himself to remember all sorts of little facts like that until it gets to be a habit with him. Both of you have been looking at Mr. Norton for about three years, and you don't know the color of his hair. And if I asked you whether he was in the habit of wearing laced shoes or button shoes, you would be stumped altogether. As a matter of fact, Mr. Norton is bald, and he wears a chestnut wig. You never noticed that? He always wears button shoes, he belongs to the Elks, and his favorite author is Dickens. The boys looked at their father in amazement. But, Dad, you've never met him. I've never been introduced to him, but I've passed him on the street a number of times. When your powers of observation have been trained as mine have been, it's no trick at all to take away a mental photograph of a man after seeing him once. If you are specially observant, it isn't hard to notice such details as that regarding the wig. A wig never has the same appearance as natural hair. But how do you know he belongs to the Elks? asked Joe. He wears the lodge emblem as a watch charm. And how do you know his favorite author is Dickens? On three separate occasions that I met Mr. Norton, I noticed that he was carrying a book. Once it was Oliver Twist. Another time it was A Tale of Two Cities. The third time it was David Copperfield. So I judge that his favorite author must be Dickens. Am I right? He always talks Dickens to us at school, said Frank. It's simple enough once you get the habit, remarked Mr. Hardy. You must train yourselves to be observant, so that in time you will automatically remember little details about people you meet and places you've visited. Now, if Harrity and Mr. Brown had been at all observant, in spite of the fact that they were surprised and frightened, they would have been able to give the police a very thorough description of the man who tried to hold up the steamboat office. And if the man happened to be a professional thief, the description would have helped the officers ascertain who he was, because once a man has served a prison term, his description is kept on file. As it is, all we know about him is that he is probably red-headed. That isn't very much to go on. 
I'm afraid Chet hasn't much chance of recovering his roadster, said Joe. You never can tell, remarked his father. It may turn up sometime. Perhaps the thief will get himself into trouble yet. Keep your eyes and ears open, and now, if you don't mind, I have some reports to write. Frank and Joe took the hint and left their father to his work. But although they talked long into the night on possible ways and means of recovering Chet's car, they were able to devise no plan for tracing the thief. And through the week that followed, there were no further clues. Chet had given up all hope of seeing the roadster again. "'I sure miss the old bus,' he told the Hardy boys after school on Friday afternoon. "'I have to take my chances on catching rides in and out of town now. "'Why, last night I walked halfway home before a car came along and gave me a lift. "'Saturday will be a pretty dull day for you now. "'You just bet your sweet life it will be dull. "'Nothing to do but sit around the farm.' "'Better come with us tomorrow,' suggested Joe. "'A bunch of us are going fishing up near the dam. "'You can meet us at the crossroads near Willow River.' "'Good idea,' said Chet. "'What time?' Ten o'clock.' "'Fine. I'll be there. "'Gosh, I see where I get a ride home. "'There goes a hay wagon, and it's heading right for the next farm.' A long wagon rumbled slowly toward the boys. A lean and solemn farmer perched on the front seat, half asleep. The horses dawdled along. "'That's Lim Billers, the laziest man in nine counties,' said Chet. "'Watch me have some fun with him.' Chet took from his pocket an automobile horn. He had originally bought it for the roadster, but had not had time to install it before the car was stolen. The horn was of a new type, very small, yet it had a particularly raucous shriek. The hardy boys grinned as they saw Chet step out into the road and swing himself lightly up onto the back of the wagon. Mr. Billers was bringing some supplies back to the farm, and Chet was hidden from view by a bag of flour. As the wagon rumbled past, Chet sounded the automobile horn. It shrieked sharply and insistently. Mr. Billers, being a lazy man, did not even look behind. He simply tugged lightly at the reins, and the horses edged over to the side of the road. Having heard the horn, Mr. Billers expected an automobile would pass, but when no car flashed by, he turned indolently in his seat and looked behind. The roadway was clear. There was not an automobile in sight. He did not see Chet doubling up with laughter on the back of the wagon. He gazed doubtfully at the Hardy boys, who were standing at the curb, trying to conceal their smiles. "'Could I swore I heard a horn,' grunted Mr. Billers. Then he tugged at the lines and brought the horses into the middle of the road again. Instantly the horn shrieked again. This time it was even louder and more insistent than before. It seemed that an automobile was right behind the wagon, clamoring to pass. Almost automatically, Mr. Billers yanked at the reins, and the horses again went to the side of the road. But again, no car went by. Again, Mr. Billers looked behind. Again, to his astonishment, he saw that the roadway was clear. "'Hanged if I didn't think I heard a horn!' exclaimed Mr. Billers, greatly puzzled as he drove on again. "'My ears must be going back on me.' But in a few minutes, the horn shrieked again. Frank and Joe, who were walking along the sidewalk, keeping abreast of the wagon so as not to miss the fun, chuckled as they saw Mr. Billers once more pull on the reins to guide the horses to the roadside. Then the farmer recollected how he had been fooled on the previous occasions, and he looked quickly around. But there was no car in sight. Mr. Billers gazed down the roadway for a long time. Then he sighed, with the air of one whose patience has long been tried. Must be something the matter with my ears, he muttered and drove on. At this moment, a luxurious sedan swept around a corner and drew up close behind the wagon. There was a chauffeur at the wheel, and he sounded his horn impatiently, for the road was narrow, and he was unable to get past. Lem Biller smiled darkly to himself and paid no attention. There it goes again, he grumbled. I must be hearing things. Hang me if I'll turn out any more when there ain't no car there to turn out for. The wagon continued in the center of the road. 
The chauffeur of the car glared at Lem Biller's back and sounded the horn again. Still, the farmer paid no attention. Chet, limp with laughter, almost rolled off the wagon. Frank and Joe could control their mirth no longer and leaned against a telephone post with shouts of glee. The chauffeur, believing that the boys were laughing at him because he could not get past, became purple with anger. He sounded the horn again and again, and finally, when Lim Billers obstinately refused to pay any attention, he looked wildly about for a policeman. As luck would have it, Constable Con Riley was ambling along Main Street at that moment, wondering if it would soon be supper time, and hoping his wife would serve corned beef and cabbage that evening. He was aroused from his trance by the chauffeur, who brought the sedan to a stop and ran over to him. "'Officer, arrest that man!' roared the chauffeur, pointing to Lem Billers. "'What for?' demanded Con, taking off his helmet and scratching his head. "'Obstructing the traffic, he won't let me pass. I've been sounding my horn for the last five minutes, and he won't let me go past.' "'Oh, ho!' said Constable Riley. "'He can't get away with that, not while Con Riley's on the beat.' And with that, he ran out into the road, shouting to Lim Billers to stop. At the constable's command, the farmer halted his team and gazed in amazement at the chauffeur and the officer as they came running up to him. "'Why won't you let him pass?' demanded the constable. "'Don't say you didn't hear me!' roared the chauffeur. "'I sounded my horn fifty times.' "'Sure I heard a horn,' admitted Billers. "'But,' he added triumphantly, "'I didn't see no car.' "'Are you blind?' asked Riley. "'There's the car.' Lim Billers looked behind. At sight of the sedan, his jaw dropped. "'Well, I'll be hanged,' he declared sadly. "'It must be my eyes is going back on me, not my ears. I looked behind three times, and I couldn't see no car.' "'Don't believe him, officer,' said the chauffeur. "'He didn't even turn around.' "'I did so,' contended Mr. Billers. "'Then why didn't you let me pass?' You didn't have no car. I heard a horn, but I didn't see no car. Thereupon, the argument grew fast and furious. Constable Riley was vastly puzzled. He didn't know what to make of it. Both the chauffeur and Lim Billers appeared to be telling the truth, yet there was something wrong somewhere. He took it all down in a notebook, while Mr. Billers and the chauffeur grew angrier and angrier at each other, until finally they were on the point of settling the matter with their fists. In the meantime, there was a steadily lengthening line of cars and wagons blocking the street, unable to get past because of the hay wagon and the sedan. A constant chorus of automobile horns sounded. Angry drivers roared at the officer to clear the road. Constable Riley threw up his hands in disgust. "'Get on your way, both of you,' he commanded. "'I can't stand here arguing all afternoon.' And while Lim Billers, wondering whether his eyes or ears had deceived him, drew his horses to the side of the road and muttered strong threats of vengeance against the chauffeur, the traffic tangle gradually abated. When he finally resumed his journey, the hardy boys could see Chet Morton lying limply in the back of the wagon with tears of laughter running down his face. As for Frank and Joe, they laughed all the way home, and during supper that evening, their spasmodic outbursts of chuckles puzzled their parents extremely. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of the Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tire tracks. Next day was Saturday, and immediately after breakfast, the Hardy Boys asked their mother to make up a lunch for them, as they intended to spend the day in the woods with a number of their school chums. Mrs. Hardy quickly made up a generous package of sandwiches, not forgetting to slip in several big slices of the boys' favorite cake, and the lads started out in the bright morning sunshine, with the whole holiday before them. They met the other boys, half a dozen in all, on the road at the outskirts of the town, and so, whistling and chattering and telling jokes, the group trudged along the dusty highway. 
Once in a while, they would explore along the fences for berry bushes, and occasionally a friendly scuffle would start to end with both laughing contestants covered with dust. When they reached the crossroads, Chet had not yet appeared, so they rested in the shade of the trees until at length the chubby youth came panting along the road, his lunch under his arm. "'If I only had my roadster, I wouldn't be late,' he said as he came up to them. "'I've been so used to it that I've forgotten how long it takes to walk this far.' "'Well, are we all set?' asked Frank. "'Everybody's here. Where are we going?' "'What do you say to Willow Grove?' "'All those in favor say aye,' demanded Chet, and there was a chorus of aye from the crowd. "'It's unanimous,' Chet decided. "'Willow Grove it shall be. Let's go.' Willow Grove was about a mile farther on. It was some distance in from the road, and was on the banks of Willow River, from which it got its name. It was an ideal place for a picnic, and as it was somewhat early in the season, it was hardly likely that other parties from the city would be in the grove that day. Frank told the other boys about Chet's adventure with the auto horn, and the story was greeted with shouts of laughter, which were redoubled when Chet told how he had later jumped down from the wagon and run along behind, shouting to Lim Billers to give him a ride. It was a shame, he confessed. The poor old chap reined in his horses and made me come up and sit on the seat beside him. He asked me if I had walked very far, and then he told me all about his argument with the policeman and the chauffeur. I could hardly keep my face straight. When the boys reached the lane that led in toward Willow Grove from the main road, they broke into a run and raced into the woods, shouting and yelling like wild Indians. Once in the friendly shade of the trees, they capered about in the joy of their Saturday freedom. Chet took charge of the lunches and stored them in a convenient clearing, and then began the rush for the river. The day passed in the usual fashion of such days. They swam, they ate, they loafed about under the trees, they played games at imminent risk of life and limb, they explored the woods, and otherwise enjoyed themselves with all the happy energy of healthy lads. Joe Hardy, who was an amateur naturalist in his way, went roaming off by himself during the afternoon while the other boys were enjoying their third swim of the day and penetrated deeper into the woods. He poked about in the undergrowth, examining various flowers and plants that came to his attention, but discovered no specimens that he had not seen before. He was just on the point of going back to the other lads when he saw before him a small clearing. It was part of the grove in which he had never been, so he plowed on through the bushes until he found himself in a clearing that appeared to be part of an abandoned roadway. It was in a low-lying part of the grove, and the ground was wet. At one point it was muddy, and in this mud Joe saw something that aroused his curiosity. "'Tire tracks, eh? There's been an automobile in here,' he muttered to himself. "'I wonder how on earth a car could get this far into the woods.' Then he remembered his father's remarks on the value of developing his powers of observation, so he went over closer and examined the marks in the mud. "'That's a strange tread,' he thought. "'I've never seen a tire mark quite like that before.' He gazed at it until he was sure that if he ever saw a similar auto tread again, he would recognize it. "'That just goes to prove that Dad was right,' said Joe. Probably I've seen auto tires like that often, but I've never noticed the markings. And now that I do notice one in particular, it seems strange to me. But I wonder what an automobile was doing in here and how it came to get here in the first place. However, he gave the matter little further thought and retraced his steps through the woods until he returned to the other boys, who were getting dressed after their swim. I thought automobiles weren't allowed in Willow Grove, he said casually to Chet Morton. Neither they are. You have to park just inside the fence. Well, somebody brought a car right down into the grove. They couldn't. There's no road. Well, there's a sort of clearing over there, said Joe, motioning in the direction from which he had just returned. It looks as if it had been a road at one time. That's probably the old creek road. It hasn't been used for years. Well, it was used just this week. I saw the marks of an automobile tire over there not ten minutes ago, and it was a mighty peculiar tread, too, like this. 
and Joe commenced to draw a replica of the design in the sand, using a thin stick of wood as a pencil. Chet Morton stared. Why, he exclaimed, there's only one car in the city has tires like that. Whose car? Mine, exclaimed Chet, springing to his feet. Where is this road you found? Joe Hardy quickly led the way, and all the other boys came trooping along behind, the whole band thrown into a state of great excitement by this unexpected discovery. They all knew that Chet's car was of an unusual make, and that the tires were distinctive. When they reached the clearing, and Chet had examined the imprint in the mud, he exclaimed, "'There's no mistake about it! My car has been here! No other car in the city has a tread like that!' "'Perhaps the car is still around here,' suggested Frank quickly. "'For all we can tell, the thief may have abandoned it and picked this road as a good place to hide it.' "'It would be an ideal place,' agreed Chet. "'This road leads off the main highway and isn't often used. Let's take a look around, anyway.' The boys quickly scattered, some taking one side of the road, the rest taking the other. For a while, the search continued without success, but at last, Frank and Chet, who were following the abandoned road farther down, gave a simultaneous cry. Here's a bypath! Before them was a narrow roadway, overgrown with weeds and low bushes that almost hid it from view. It led from the abandoned road into the very depths of the wood. Without hesitation, the two boys plunged into it. The narrow roadway widened out farther on, then wound about a heavy clump of trees, until it came to an end in a wide clearing. And in the clearing stood Chet Morton's lost roadster. "'My car!' yelled Chet in delight. His shout was heard by all the other boys, and the sound of snapping twigs and crackling branches soon told Frank and Chet that the others were losing no time in reaching the scene. Chet's delight was boundless. He examined the car with minute care in every particular, while the other boys crowded about. At last, he straightened up with a smile of satisfaction. She hasn't been damaged a bit, all ready to run. The thief just hid the old bus in here and made a getaway. Come on, fellows, we don't walk back home today. We ride. He clambered into the car, and in a few seconds the engine roared. There was sufficient room in the clearing to permit him to turn the roadster about, and when he swung the car around and headed up the bypath, the boys gave a cheer and hastened to clamber on board. Lurching and swaying, the roadster reached the abandoned road, and from there it was an easy run to the main highway. In spite of the fact that it had been left in the bush for probably a week, the roadster was in perfect condition, and the engine ran smoothly. Joe was given the seat of honor beside the driver because he had discovered the tire marks that had led to the recovery of the car, and the other boys distributed themselves as best they could. They clung to the running boards, hung precariously to the back, and one lad even straddled the hood. In this manner, the triumphal procession returned to Bayport. But as the cheering lads came down the main street, they noticed that there was an unwanted air of excitement in the town. People were standing on street corners in little groups, talking earnestly, and when the boys spied Detective Smuff of the police force striding along with a portentous frown, they called out to him. "'What's on your mind today, Detective? Chet got his car back.' "'I've got something more important than stolen cars to worry about,' declared Detective Smuff. "'The Tower Mansion has been robbed!' End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mansion Robbery Tower Mansion was one of the show places of Bayport. Few people in the city had ever been permitted to enter the place, and the admiration the palatial building excited was solely by reason of its exterior appearance. But the first thing a newcomer to Bayport usually asked was, who owns that magnificent house on the hill? It was an immense, rambling stone structure situated on the top of the hill overlooking the bay, and it could be seen for miles, silhouetted against the skyline like some ancient feudal castle. 
This resemblance to a castle was heightened by the fact that at each end of the mansion rose a high tower. One of these towers had been built when the mansion was first erected by Major Applegate, an eccentric old army man who had made millions by lucky real estate deals and had laid the foundation for the Applegate fortune. The mansion had been the admiration of its day, and in its time had seen much gaiety. But as the years passed, the Applegate family became scattered, until at last there remained but Herd Applegate and his sister Adelia, who continued living in the vast and lonely old mansion. Herd Applegate was a man of about sixty years of age. He was a tall, stooped man, eccentric in his ways, and his life seemed to be devoted to the collection of rare stamps. He was an authority on the subject, and nothing else in life appeared to hold a great deal of interest for him. The only visitors at Tower Mansion were philatelists from New York, or experts, desirous of appraising some new stamp that Herd Applegate had managed to secure from some remote part of the world. It had often been said in Bayport that Herd Applegate had accomplished only two things in life. He had collected stamps, and he had built a new tower on the mansion. The new tower, a duplicate of the original tower at the opposite end of the great building, had been built but a few years, even well within the memory of the two Hardy boys. Adelia Applegate, who lived in the tower mansion with her brother, was a maiden lady of uncertain years. The records in Bayport City Hall gave her age as fifty-five, but Miss Applegate admitted it to no one. She was as eccentric as her brother, and lived very much to herself being seldom seen in the city. She was at one time a blonde, but she had endeavored to retain her youth by dyeing her hair, with the result that it was a now a sort of dusty black. Chet Morton was fond of saying that Miss Applegate used to be a blonde, but she died. She dressed in all colors of the rainbow, and her infrequent excursions into Bayport stores, when she would order the clerks about like so many soldiers, shouting at them in her high, cracked voice, had become historic on account of the wild and colorful garments she would carry off with her. These eccentric people were reputed to be enormously wealthy, although they lived simply and kept only a few servants. So when Herd Applegate came into the Bayport police station that afternoon and reported that the safe in his library had been broken open and that it had been robbed of all the securities and jewels it contained, the rumors that soon spread about the city magnified the actual loss until it became common talk that the loss amounted anywhere from 100000 to a million dollars. When Frank and Joe Hardy arrived home that evening, they met Herd Applegate just leaving the house. The man tapped the steps with his cane as he came out, and when he met the boys, he gave them an abrupt and piercing glare. "'Good day,' he growled in a grudging manner, and went on his way. "'He must have been asking Dad to take up the case,' said Frank to his brother, as soon as Herd Applegate was out of earshot. They hurried into the house, eager to find out more about the robbery, and in the hallway they met Fenton Hardy, who had just seen Mr. Applegate to the door. "'I hear the Tower Mansion was robbed,' said Joe. Mr. Hardy nodded. "'Yes, Mr. Applegate was just here. He wants me to handle the case.' "'How much was taken?' "'Quite curious, aren't you?' remarked Mr. Hardy with a smile. "'Well, I don't suppose it will do any harm to tell you. The safe in the Applegate Library was opened. The loss will be about forty thousand dollars, I believe.' "'We heard it was over a hundred thousand, exclaimed Joe. Rumors always exaggerate. Forty thousand dollars is the figure Mr. Applegate puts it at. And it's quite enough, too. All in securities and jewels. <sighs> exclaimed Frank. Quite a haul. When did it happen? Either last night or this morning. He did not get up until after ten o'clock this morning, and he did not go into the library until nearly noon. Then he discovered the theft. How was the safe opened? It was either opened by someone who knew the combination, or else by a very clever crook. It wasn't dynamited at all. I'm going up to the house in a few minutes. Mr. Applegate is to call for me. Can't we go along? asked Joe eagerly. Mr. Hardy looked at his sons with a smile. 
Well, if you are so anxious to be detectives, I suppose it is about as good a chance as any to watch a crime investigation from the inside. If Mr. Applegate doesn't object, I suppose you may come along. In a few minutes, an automobile drew up before the Hardy home. Mr. Applegate was sitting in the rear seat, resting his chin on his cane. When Mr. Hardy mentioned the boy's request, he merely grunted assent, so Joe and Frank clambered into the car with their father. They were tremendously excited at the prospect of being on the inside in the mysterious case. While the car bowled along over the city roads toward the tower mansion that was gloomily silhouetted against the sky, Mr. Hardy and Mr. Applegate discussed the robbery. "'I don't really need a detective in this case,' snapped Herd Applegate. Don't need one at all. It's as clear as the nose on your face. I know who took the stuff, but I can't prove it. Whom do you suspect? asked Fenton Hardy. Only one man in the world could have taken it. Robinson. Robinson? Yes, Henry Robinson, the caretaker. He's the man. The Hardy boys looked at one another in consternation. Henry Robinson, the caretaker of the Tower Mansion, was the father of one of their closest chums. Perry Robinson, nicknamed Slim, was to have accompanied them on their jaunt to the woods that day, but had failed to appear. The reason was now evident. But that Henry Robinson should be accused of the robbery seemed absurd. The boys had met Slim's father, and he had appeared to them as a good-natured, easy-going man, the soul of truth and honesty. "'I don't believe it,' whispered Frank. "'Neither do I,' returned his brother. "'What makes you suspect Robinson?' asked Mr. Hardy of Herd Applegate. "'He's the only person besides my sister and me who ever saw that safe opened and closed. He could have learned the combination if he kept his eyes and ears open.' I believe he did. But is that your only reason for suspecting him? More than that. This morning he paid off a note at the bank. It was a note for $900, and I know for a fact that he didn't have more than $100 to his name a few days ago. The Robinsons have been hard up, for they had sickness in the family last winter, and Henry Robinson has had a hard time meeting his debt since then. Now where did he raise nine hundred dollars so suddenly? Perhaps he has a good explanation, said Mr. Hardy mildly. It doesn't do to jump at conclusions. Oh, he'll have an explanation, all right, sniffed Mr. Applegate. But it will have to be a mighty good one to satisfy me. Luckily, he'll not have to satisfy Mr. Applegate, but will have to convince a jury, if it gets that far, whispered Joe in his brother's ear. The automobile was speeding up the wide driveway that led to Tower Mansion, and within a few minutes it drew up at the front entrance. Mr. Applegate dismissed the driver, and Mr. Hardy and the two boys accompanied the eccentric man into the house. Nothing had been disturbed in the library since the discovery of the theft. Mr. Hardy examined the open safe, then drew a magnifying glass from his pocket, and with minute care inspected the dial of the combination lock. Then he examined the windows, the doorknobs, all places where there might be fingerprints. At last he shook his head. A smooth job, he observed. The fellow must have worn gloves, not a fingerprint in the room. No need of looking for fingerprints, said Applegate. It was Robinson, that's who it was. Better send for him, advised Mr. Hardy. I'd like to ask him a few questions. Mr. Applegate rang for one of the servants and instructed him to tell Mr. Robinson he was wanted in the library at once. Mr. Hardy glanced at the boys. You had better wait in the hallway, he suggested. I want to ask some questions, and it might embarrass Mr. Robinson if you were here. The lads readily withdrew, and in the hallway they met Henry Robinson, the caretaker, and his son Perry. Mr. Robinson was calm but pale, and at the doorway he patted his son on the shoulder. "'Don't worry, son,' he said. "'It'll be all right.' With that he entered the library. Slim Robinson turned to his two chums. "'My dad is innocent!' he cried. End of chapter 7
Chapter 8 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Arrest There was something in Perry Robinson's tone that made Frank and Joe extremely sorry for their chum, for it seemed that the boy realized that the case looked black against his father. Although the hardy lads realized that it was only natural that Perry should stand up for his father, they shared some of his conviction that Mr. Robinson was not guilty. "'Of course he's innocent,' agreed Frank. "'He'll be able to clear himself all right, Perry.' "'But everything looks pretty black against him,' said Perry, who was pale and shaken. "'Unless your father can catch the real thief, I'm afraid Dad will be blamed for it.' "'Everybody knows your father is honest,' said Joe consolingly. "'He has a good record. Even Applegate will have to admit that.' "'A good record won't help him very much if he is blamed for this and can't clear himself. "'And Dad admits that he did know the combination of the safe. "'He knew it? "'Accidentally. He was cleaning the library fireplace one day "'when he found a slip of paper with numbers marked on it. The combination was so simple that anyone could remember it if he had read it once. Dad didn't realize what it was until he had studied it a while, and then he put it back on Mr. Applegate's desk. The window was open, and the breeze had blown the paper to the floor. Does Applegate know that? Not yet, but Dad is going to tell him now. He says he knows it will look bad for him, but he's going to tell the truth about it. He knew the combination— although, of course, he would never think of using it. From the library came the dull hum of voices. The harsh tones of Herd Applegate occasionally rose above the murmur of conversation, and once the boys heard Mr. Robinson's voice rise sharply. I didn't do it. I tell you, I didn't take that money. Then where did you get the nine hundred you paid on that note? demanded Mr. Applegate. There was silence for a while. "'Where did you get it?' "'I'm not at liberty to tell you.' "'You won't tell?' "'I can't.' "'Why not?' "'I got the money honestly. "'That's all I can say about it.' "'Oh, ho!" Oh, exclaimed Applegate. "'You got the money honestly, "'yet you can't tell me where it came from. "'That's very likely, isn't it? "'If you got it honestly, "'you shouldn't be ashamed to tell where you got it.' "'I'm not ashamed.' but I'm not at liberty to tell. Mighty funny thing that you should get $900 so quickly. You were pretty hard up last week, weren't you? Had to ask for an advance on your month's wages. I admit it. And then the day of this robbery, you suddenly have $900 that you can't explain. Mr. Hardy's calm voice broke in. Of course, I don't like to pry into your private affairs, Mr. Robinson he said, but it would be best if you could clear up this matter of the money. You must admit yourself that it doesn't look promising. I know it looks bad, replied the caretaker doggedly, but I can't tell you where that money came from. And you admit knowing the combination of the safe, too, broke in Applegate. I didn't know that before. Why didn't you tell me? I didn't consider it important enough. I had found the combination by accident, and I had no intention of using it. As a matter of fact, I don't think I could remember it accurately right now. I just put the paper back and decided to say nothing about it to save trouble. And yet you come and tell me about it now? I have nothing to conceal. If I had taken the money, I wouldn't very likely be telling you now that I knew the combination. Yes, agreed Mr. Hardy. That's a point in your favor. It is, asked Applegate. You're just clever enough to think up a trick like that, Robinson. You think that if you come to me right now and admit you knew the combination, I'll believe that you are so honest that you couldn't have committed this robbery. Very clever, but not clever enough. There's enough evidence right here now to convict you, and I'm not going to delay another minute. There was the sound of a telephone receiver being lifted, and then Applegate's voice continued. Police station. After a short wait, he went on. Hello? Police station? This is Applegate speaking. Applegate! Heard Applegate. Well, I think we found our man. In that robbery? Yes, Robinson. 
You thought so, eh? So did I, but I wasn't sure. He has practically convicted himself by his own story. Yes, I want him arrested. You'll be up right away? Fine. Goodbye. The telephone tinkled. You're not going to have me arrested, Mr. Applegate. Why not? You took the money. But I'm innocent, I swear it. Haven't I always been honest ever since I came to work for you? Have you ever had any fault to find with me? Not until now, returned Applegate grimly. It might have been better to wait a while, suggested Mr. Hardy mildly. Of course, it is entirely in your hands, Mr. Applegate, and I admit the case looks rather bad against Mr. Robinson, but perhaps some more evidence may turn up. What more evidence do we want? The man's guilty. It's as plain as the nose on your face. If he wants to return the rest of the jewels and securities, I'll see what can be done toward having the charge reduced. But that's all. But I can't return them. I didn't take them. I suppose you have them hidden away safely by now, hoping to get them when you get out of penitentiary, eh? It'll be a long time, Robinson. A long time. In the hallway, the boys listened in growing excitement. The case had taken an abrupt and tragic turn. Both the Hardy boys were sorry for their chum Slim, who looked as though he might collapse under the strain. He's innocent, muttered the boy over and over again. I know he's innocent. They can't arrest him. My dad never stole a dollar in his life. Frank patted him on the shoulder. Brace up, old chap he advised. It looks pretty bad just now, but your father will be able to clear himself. Never fear. I'll, I'll have to tell mother, stammered Slim. This will break her heart. And my sisters. Frank and Joe led him down through the hallway and along a corridor that led to a wing of the mansion where the Robinson family had rooms. There, in a neat but sparsely furnished apartment, they found Mrs. Robinson, a gentle, kindly-faced woman, somewhat lame, who was sitting anxiously in a chair by the window. Her two daughters, Paula and Tessie, twins, were by her side, and all looked up in expectation as the lads came in. "'What news, son?' asked Mrs. Robinson bravely, after she had greeted the Hardy boys. "'Bad, mother.' They're not, they're not arresting him, cried Paula, springing forward. Perry nodded dumbly. But they can't, cried Tessie protestingly. He's innocent. He couldn't do anything like that. It's wrong. Mrs. Robinson began to cry, quite silently. Perry went over to his mother and awkwardly patted her shoulder, his face white and stern. The twins gazed at one another with desperate eyes. Frank and Joe, their hearts too full for utterance, withdrew softly from the room. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Red Hair the arrest of Henry Robinson caused a sensation in Bayport, for the caretaker of Tower Mansion was one of the last men in the city whom one would have suspected of dishonesty. There was a great deal of public sympathy for the family, but little for the accused, as most people seemed to take it for granted that he would not have been arrested if he had not had something to do with the crime. But the Hardy boys were not satisfied. "'I'm positive Henry Robinson is innocent,' said Frank to his brother the next morning. "'There's a great deal about this case that hasn't come to the surface yet. "'I have a sort of sneaking idea that the man who stole Chet Morton's car had something to do with this.' "'He was a criminal. That much is certain,' agreed Joe. "'He stole an automobile, and he tried to hold up the ticket office. "'I'd like to go back to the place where we saw the wrecked car.' You never know what evidence we might find. There might be something there that would identify the chap. I'm with you. Let's go this morning. 
So within the hour, the boys were on their motorcycles, speeding along the shore road toward the place where the speed fiend's car had been wrecked in the bushes. "'I'd certainly like to do something to help clear Mr. Robinson,' said Frank. "'It's pretty tough on Slim and his mother and sisters. "'We probably won't be able to do very much. "'If Dad can't clear him, I don't think we can help a great deal. "'But it's worthwhile trying. "'It sure is. "'And I've had a hunch all along that we didn't investigate the wreck of that car closely enough. "'Well, we'll make a thorough job of it this time.' When the boys reached the scene of the wreck, they found the smashed car just where they had seen it last. The tires had been taken, and some of the accessories that had escaped destruction had been stripped from the automobile, but the car had been so badly smashed that there were few evidences of disturbance. Leaving their motorcycles by the side of the road, the lads plunged down into the bushes and busied themselves examining the wreckage. Joe hunted through the side pockets in the hope that there might be papers or some other means of identification, but in this he was disappointed. There were no license plates, but Frank managed to secure the engine number, and this he jotted down in a notebook he carried. Perhaps this will give us a clue. Although I have an idea that the fellow got this car in the same way he got Chet's, it's probably a stolen automobile. For a time, they rummaged around among the wreckage without success. Then at last, Frank gave a low cry. "'Here's something!' he exclaimed. "'Look!' Joe came over to where he was standing, and Frank plucked something from the front seat of the wrecked car. "'Red hair!' In his hand, Frank held a small tuft of vivid red hair. It was very coarse in texture, and the surprising part of it was that the hairs were not separate, but were attached to sort of a tough linen. "'Why, it's part of a wig,' said Frank, examining the hair more closely. "'You're right,' agreed his brother. "'No human hair ever grew like that. "'Part of the fellow's wig was torn when the car was smashed up. "'And that explains why Harity and his witness couldn't agree on the color of the fellow's hair,' exclaimed Joe in excitement. "'I see it now. The man didn't wear the wig when he held up the steamboat office, and the minute he reached the car, he put it on again. "'That explains why Brown saw a red-haired man driving away in Chet's roadster, and why Harity was positive that man wasn't red-headed.' "'That's a real clue,' exclaimed Joe.' We ought to tell Dad about this. And we will, too, said Frank, beginning to scramble through the bushes back toward the road. He put the fragment of the red wig carefully in an inner pocket, and then the Hardy boys started back toward Bayport. The clue was slight, of course, but still, it served to clear up the disagreement as to the color of the hold-up man's hair. It also served to prove conclusively that the man who had passed Frank and Joe on the shore road at such breakneck speed, and who had later wrecked his car, was the same man who had stolen Chet's roadster and had attempted to hold up the steamboat ticket office. "'I guess Dad will think we aren't such poor detectives after all,' Joe exulted as they brought their motorcycles to a stop in the yard of the Hardy home. Their father was in the library. But in their excitement, the lads forgot to rap at the door and rushed into the room without ceremony. "'Dad, we found a clue!' cried Joe when he saw his father sitting at the huge oak desk. Then he fell back, embarrassed, when he saw that there was someone else in the room. "'Beg pardon,' said Frank, and the boys would have retreated, but Mr. Hardy's visitor turned around, and they saw that it was Perry Robinson. "'It's only me,' said Slim. "'Don't go.' Perry has been trying to shed a little more light on the tower robbery, explained Mr. Hardy. But what is this clue you're talking of? It isn't about the robbery, replied Frank, although it might have something to do with it, for all we know. It's about the red-headed man who stole Chet's car and who tried to hold up the steamboat ticket office. What about him? This, said Frank, taking the fragment of red hair from his pocket and showing it to his father. The fellow wore a wig. Mr. Hardy examined the little tuft of hair closely. Where did you find it? he asked. And the wreckage of that smashed car. 
Mr. Hardy nodded. That seems to link up a pretty good chain of evidence. The man who passed you on the shore road wrecked his car, then stole Chet's roadster, and afterward tried to hold up the ticket office. When he failed in that, he abandoned the roadster. He wore a red wig that he took off occasionally to confuse pursuers. If we could only find the wig, we might be able to get further information. Possibly. The man was evidently a professional thief, explained Frank. If he was smart enough to wear a wig, he was evidently an old-timer at the game. And if he failed in the ticket office hold-up, who knows but what he might have been hanging around the city waiting for another chance. Gosh, you may be right at that, exclaimed Perry. I was just telling your father that I saw a strange man lurking about the grounds of Tower Mansion two days before the robbery. I didn't think anything of it at the time, and in the shock of Dad's arrest, I forgot about it. Did you get a good look at him? Could you describe him? asked the detective. I'm afraid I couldn't. It was in the evening, and I was sitting by the window studying. I happened to look up, and I saw this fellow moving about under the trees near the wall. Later on, I heard one of the dogs barking in another part of the grounds, and shortly afterward, I saw someone running across the lawn. But I thought it was probably just a tramp. Did he wear a hat or a cap? As near as I can remember it was a cap. His clothes were dark. And you couldn't see his face? No. Well, it's not much to go on, but it might be linked up with Frank's idea that the man who stole the roadster might have still been hanging around. Mr. Hardy thought deeply for a few moments. I am going to bring all these facts to Mr. Applegate's attention, and I am also going to have a talk with the police authorities. I don't think they have enough evidence to warrant holding your father, Perry. Do you think you can have him released? asked the boy eagerly. I'm sure of it. In fact, I think Mr. Applegate is beginning to realize now that he made a mistake, and I don't think the police are any too anxious to go ahead with the case on the meager evidence in their possession. It will be wonderful if we can have Dad back with us again, said Perry, although it won't be quite the same. He'll be under a cloud as long as this mystery isn't cleared up. And of course, Mr. Applegate won't employ him any more. All the more reason why we should get busy and clear up the affair, returned Mr. Hardy. You boys can help. How? By keeping your eyes and ears open and by using your wits. That's all there is to detective work. Well, you can just bet that if it will clear Slim's dad, we'll be listening and looking for every clue there is, Joe assured his father. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Samuel D. Graham An Important Discovery when the Hardy boys returned from school the next afternoon, they saw that a crowd had collected about the bulletin board in the post office. "'Wonder what's up now?' said Joe, pushing his way forward. Boy-like, he was able to make his way through the crowd with the agility of an eel, and Frank was not slow in following. On the board was a large poster, the ink on which was scarcely dry. At the top, in enormous black letters, they read, "'One thousand dollar reward!' Underneath, in slightly smaller type, came the following. The above reward will be paid for information leading to the arrest of the person or persons who broke into Tower Mansion and stole from a safe in the library jewels and securities, as follows. Then came a list of the jewels and negotiable bonds that had been taken from Tower Mansion, the jewels being fully described, and the numbers of the bonds being given. It was announced that the reward was offered by Herd Applegate. "'Why, that must mean that the charge against Mr. Robinson has been dropped!' exclaimed Joe. "'It looks like it. Let's go and see if we can't find Slim.' All about them, people were commenting on the size of the reward, and there were many expressions of envy for the person who should be fortunate enough to solve the mystery. "'A thousand dollars,' said Frank as they made their way out of the post office. "'That's a lot of money, Joe.' "'I'll say it is.' And there's no reason why we haven't as good a chance of getting it as anyone else. Golly, if only we could. 
Why not? Let's get at this case in real earnest. Of course, we would do what we could anyway, but a thousand dollars? It's worth trying for. Dad and the police are barred from the reward, for it's their duty to find the thief if they can. But if we find him, we get the money. And we'll have the satisfaction of clearing Mr. Robinson, too. Joe, let's get at this case in earnest. We have some clues right now, and we can follow them up. I'm with you, but they're slim now. Perry Robinson was coming down the street toward them. He looked much happier than he had been the previous evening, and when he saw the Hardy Boys, his face lighted up. Dad is free, he told them, thanks to your father. The charge has been dropped. Gee, but I'm glad to hear that, exclaimed Joe. I see they're offering a reward. Your father convinced Mr. Applegate that it must have been an outside job. That is, that it was the work of a professional crook. And the police admitted there wasn't much evidence against Dad, so they let him go. I tell you, it was a great thing for my mother and sisters. They were almost crazy with worry. No wonder, commented Frank. What is your father going to do now? I don't know, Slim admitted heavily. Of course, we've had to move out of Tower Mansion. Mr. Applegate said that while the charge had been dropped, he wasn't altogether convinced in his own mind that Dad hadn't had something to do with it. So he dismissed him. That's tough luck. But he'll be able to get another job somewhere. I'm not so sure about that. People aren't likely to employ a man that's been suspected of stealing. Dad tried two or three places this afternoon, but he was turned down. The Hardy boys were silent. They were sorry for the Robinsons, for they knew only too well that the family were badly off financially, and that in view of the robbery, it would indeed be difficult for Mr. Robinson to get another position. "'We've rented a small house just outside the city,' went on Slim. "'It is cheap, and we'll have to get along.' There was no false pride about Perry Robinson. He faced the facts as they came, and made the best of them. "'But if Dad doesn't get a job, it will mean that I'll have to go to work.' But, Slim, you'd have to quit school. I can't help that. I wouldn't want to, for you know I was trying for the class medal this year. But, oh well. The Hardy Boys realized how much it would mean to their chum to leave school at this stage. Perry Robinson was an ambitious boy, and one of the cleverest in his class. He had always wanted to continue his studies, go to a university, and his teachers had predicted a brilliant career for him. Now it seemed that all his ambitions would have to be thrown overboard because of this misfortune. "'Don't worry, Slim,' comforted Frank. "'Joe and I are going to plug away at this affair until we get to the bottom of it.' "'It's mighty good of you fellows,' said Slim gratefully. "'I won't forget it in a hurry. You've been pretty white to me through all this.' "'Aw, oh, shucks,' muttered Frank, embarrassed. "'It's the reward we're after. Applegate is offering a thousand dollars.' Oh, I know it isn't altogether the reward. You would do it to help us anyway, and you know it. Look what you've already done. Well, we're going to get busy, Joe said hastily. See you later, Slim. Don't worry too much. I think everything will be all right. Slim tried to smile, but it was evident that he was deeply worried, and when he walked away, it was not with the light, springy, carefree step his chums had previously known. What's the first move, Frank? We had better get a full description of those jewels. Perhaps the thief tried to pawn them. We can call at all the pawn shops and see what we can find out. Then we may be able to get a line on the thief. You know, he might pawn something here, if he had to have money with which to get out of town. Good idea! Do you think Applegate will give us a list? We won't have to ask him. Dad should have all that information. Let's go and ask him right now. But when the lads returned home and asked their father for a description of the jewels, they met with a disappointment. "'I'm quite willing to give you all that information,' said Fenton Hardy, "'but I don't think it will be much use. Furthermore, I'll bet I can tell just what you are going to do.' "'What?' "'You're going to make the rounds of the pawn shops and see if any of the jewels have been turned in.' The Hardy boys looked at one another in consternation. "'How did you ever guess that?' asked Frank. Their father smiled. "'Because it is just what I have already done. 
Not an hour after I was called in on the case, I had a full description of all those jewels in every pawn shop in the city. More than that, the description has been sent to jewelry firms and pawn shops in other cities near here, and also to the New York police. Out after the reward, eh? said Mr. Hardy shrewdly. Yes, and we'll get it, too. I hope you do. But you can't ask me to help you any more than I've done. It's my case, too, remember. So from now on, you are part of my opposition. It's a go. More power to you, then. And Mr. Hardy returned to his desk. He had a sheaf of reports from shops and agencies in various parts of the state through which he had been trying to trace the stolen jewels and securities. But in every case, the report was the same. There had been no trace of the gems or bonds taken from Tower Mansion. When the boys left their father's study, they went outside and sat on the back steps, silently regarding their motorcycles. "'What shall we do now?' asked Joe. "'I don't know. Dad sure took the wind out of our sails that time, didn't he?' "'I'll say he did. But it was just as well. Saved us a lot of trouble. We might have been going around to all the pawn shops in the city and not getting anywhere.' Looks as if Dad had the inside track on the case anyway. If any of the jewels are turned in, he will be the first to hear of it. What chance have we? I'm hanged if I'll give up, declared Frank with determination. We know that there was a strange man hanging around Tower Mansion, and we know that there was a red-headed crook in town. Perhaps those two facts aren't connected, but I think they are. And we know he stole Chet's roadster. And left it in the woods. Yes, and say, Joe, we didn't take too much time to look around when that roadster was found, did we? What's the use? The roadster was there and Chet got it back. No, but the man who stole the car had been there, too. Perhaps he left some clue. Joe slapped his knee with an open hand. I never thought of that, Frank. Let's go right back there now. Come on! Eagerly, the Hardy Boys dashed over to their motorcycles. In a few minutes, they were speeding through the streets of Bayport, out toward the woods where Chet Morton's roadster had been abandoned. They were fired with enthusiasm again, and in spite of the momentary setback they had received when their father squelched Frank's plan of going around to the pawn shops, they felt now that they were on a new trail. They came to the abandoned road that led into the woods, and they brought their motorcycles as far as possible, finally leaving them by the roadside and going ahead on foot. Frank located the place where the roadster had been driven off into the woods, where the trees were still bent and broken, and the two boys plunged into the depths of the thickets. At last, the hardy boys emerged into the little cleared space where the roadster had been found. Everything was just as they had left it. They examined the ground carefully. He might have dropped letters from his pocket or something, said Joe hopefully as they explored the clearing. But the auto thief had not been so careless. There was not even a footprint, for the boys had trampled the ground thoroughly after the roadster had been discovered. If I had only thought to look for footprints at the time, groaned Joe in disappointment. Or fingerprints. He must have left fingerprints somewhere about the car. If he was a professional crook, we could have traced him easily. Too late now. Chet has had the car washed since then. We didn't think of it in time. Their search was without success, and the Hardy Boys were about to give up in disappointment when Frank left the clearing and began to hunt about in the bushes. I guess we might as well go home, said Joe. We've come hunting for clues too late. If we had any sense, we would have looked for fingerprints and— he was interrupted by a shout from his brother. Joe, come here quick. I found something. There was no mistaking the excitement in Frank's voice. Joe lost no time in scrambling through the bushes until he reached his brother's side. Frank was standing in the midst of a thicket, holding up something red and bushy. It was a wig. The red wig, exclaimed Joe, his eyes widening. Not only the wig, replied Frank, but this, and he bent over to pick up a battered hat from the ground. And this, whereupon he picked up a worn coat. They belong to the crook. It couldn't have been anyone else. He must have disguised himself here and left the wig and things in the bush when he abandoned the car. 
End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Hardy Investigates. The Hardy boys looked at one another in growing excitement. What ought we do about it? asked Joe. I'm going to tell Dad what we've found. But didn't he say he would be working the case on his own and that we would be opposition? This is different. We have a real clue here, but we don't know how to use it. You can bet Dad will know what to do. He'll act fairly with us. If it leads to anything, he'll see that we get credit for what we've done. I guess you're right, Frank. This is a little too big for us to handle ourselves. But imagine finding that wig. What luck! There's nothing else around, is there? Let's look. Although the Hardy boys scoured the woods in that vicinity thoroughly, they found nothing more. But the wig, the hat, and the coat gave promise of interesting developments. Frank hunted through all the pockets of the coat in the faint hope of finding something that would identify the previous wearer, but in this he was disappointed. So they went back to the abandoned road and remounted their motorcycles, returning to Bayport with the articles they had found in the woods. Their disappointment had turned to jubilation, for now they felt that they were definitely on the trail of the mysterious man in the red wig, and while ostensibly there was no connection between this fellow and the thief who had robbed Tower Mansion, Frank had, as he said, a hunch that the auto thief and the robber of the mansion were one and the same man. If we ever lay our hands on the man who stole Chet's roadster, I'm sure we'll have gone a long way toward solving the tower affair, said Frank to his brother. I may be wrong, but I have an idea that the fellow was a professional crook who first set out to rob the steamboat office. Then, when he was frightened off, he hung around the city and waited his chance to rob Tower Mansion. Mr. Hardy was still in the library when the boys returned home. The great detective was frankly surprised when his sons again entered the room, and he looked up with the suspicion of a twinkle in his eyes. "'What? More clues?' he exclaimed. "'Surely not so soon.' "'You bet we have more clues,' exclaimed Frank eagerly. "'And real clues this time. We're going to turn them over to you.' "'But I thought the two of you were working on this case in your own way. Remember, I'm the opposition.' Well, to tell the truth, we don't know just what to do with what we found, admitted Frank. And anyway, we know you'll be fair with us, so it doesn't matter. Look! And with that, he tossed the red wig on the table. He kept the coat and hat behind his back. Fenton Hardy leaned forward quickly and picked up the wig with an inquiring glance at his sons. So, he murmured, you found the wig? He examined it intently. Then he opened a drawer of his desk and produced the fragment of a wig that the boys had found in the smashed car by the road. This he applied to a torn part of the wig itself. It fitted perfectly. "'It's the wig, all right,' he declared, looking up. "'Where did you find it? By the smashed car?' "'No. Hidden in the bushes near the place where Ched's roadster was found.' Mr. Hardy whistled solemnly. "'Good work.' He turned the wig over and over in his hands, carefully examined it under a microscope, and then tossed it back on the desk. "'There aren't so many wigs sold that one can't trace them,' he observed. "'This happens to be made by a small company that doesn't turn out a great many wigs in a year. It's sort of a sideline with them.' "'How can you tell?' "'There's a little mark on the inside that distinguishes the manufacturer. Just a trademark, hardly noticeable.' And we found these as well, said Frank, handing over the coat and hat. Mr. Hardy's eyes opened wide. Well, well, he exclaimed. You have been busy, haven't you? They were all hidden in the same place. And well hidden, too, I warrant. We were sure there must be clues of some kind around that car, so we searched every inch of the woods roundabout. Good, said Mr. Hardy approvingly. You didn't miss any chances. I'm not saying these clues will lead to the capture of the fellow, but they will go a long way toward finding him. What should we do with them? Mr. Hardy looked up at his sons and smiled. Well, 
You've shared your clues with me, so I suppose I may as well share some of my experience with you. What do you say if I go to the city and try to trace up some of these labels? This hat, for instance. And he picked it up from the table, examining the band intently. There is a label here. Of course, the hat may have been sold a long time ago, and it isn't likely that the man who sold it would remember who bought it. But there is always the chance that the store may not be far from where the fellow lives. You get my idea? And the coat, too. If we can find any trace of who bought the wig, we may be able to connect up the other things as well. Gosh, I never thought of that, admitted Frank. It's a slim chance, but as I said before, we can't afford to overlook any chances. I'll take them to the city and see what I can do. It may mean everything, and it may mean nothing. Don't be disappointed if I come back empty-handed, and don't be surprised if I come back with some valuable information. Mr. Hardy tossed the wig, the coat, and the hat into a club bag that was standing open near his desk. The great detective was accustomed to being called away suddenly on strange errands, and he was always prepared to leave at a moment's notice. "'Not much use starting now,' he said, glancing at his watch. "'But I'll go to the city the first thing in the morning. In the meantime, don't rest on your oars, as the saying is. Keep your eyes and your ears open for more clues. The case isn't over yet by any means.' Mr. Hardy picked up some papers on his desk as a hint that the interview was over and the boys left the library. They were in a state of high excitement, for they were confident now that they had made valuable progress in the case, and they were sure that if the wig and the garments could be of any use at all toward locating the crook, Mr. Hardy would be the man to use them. When they went to bed that night they could hardly sleep, so elated were they over their discovery near the abandoned roadway. He must have been a pretty smart crook, murmured Joe, after they had talked long into the night. That idea about the wig was clever. I'll bet he was an experienced guy. The smarter they are, the harder they fall, replied Frank. It's the experienced crook that the police always look for. If this fellow had any kind of a record at all, it won't take long for Dad to run him down. I've heard Dad say that there is no such thing as a clever crook. If he was really clever, he wouldn't be a crook at all. Yes, I guess there's something in that, too. But it shows that we're not up against any ordinary amateur. This fellow must be a slippery customer. He'll have to be mighty slippery from now on. Once Dad has a few clues to work on, he never lets up till he gets his man. Well, let's hope he gets this one. He'll think a lot more of us as detectives if he does. And with that, the boys fell asleep. When they went down to breakfast the following morning, they found that Fenton Hardy had left for New York on an early morning train. The Hardy boys went to school, but all through that morning they could scarcely keep their minds on the work. Their thoughts were far afield. They were wondering how Fenton Hardy was faring on his quest in New York, and it was not until after Frank had drawn a reprimand from one of his teachers, because he absentmindedly answered Red Wig when asked to name the capital of Kansas, that they settled down to work and tried to put the affair of the wig and the abandoned clothes out of their minds. Slim Robinson was at school that day, but after four o'clock he confided to the Hardy boys that he was leaving. "'It's no use,' he said. Father can't keep me in school any longer, and it's up to me to pitch in and help the family. I'm to start work tomorrow for a grocery company. And you wanted to go to college, exclaimed Frank. It's a shame, that's what it is. Can't be helped, replied Perry with a grimace. I can consider myself lucky I got this far. I guess I'll have to give up all those ideas now and settle down to learn the grocery business. There's one good thing about it. I'll have a chance to learn it from the ground up. I'm starting in the delivery department. Perhaps in about fifty years, I'll be head of the firm. You'll make good at whatever you tackle, Joe assured him. But I'm sorry you won't be able to go through college as you wished. Don't give up hope yet, Slim. You never know what may happen. Perhaps they'll find the fellow who did rob Tower Mansion. Both boys wanted to tell their chum about the clues they had discovered the previous day, but the same thought was in their minds, that it would be unwise to raise false hopes.
It would go much harder with Perry, they knew, if he began to think the capture of the thief was imminent, only to have the hope dashed to earth again. So they said goodbye to him and wished him good luck. Perry tried hard to be cheerful, but his smile was very faint as he turned away from them and walked off down the street. "'Gosh, but I'm sorry for him,' said Frank as they went home. He was such a hard worker in school, and he counted so much on going to college. "'We've just got to clear up the tower robbery. That's all there is to it,' declared his brother. "'Perhaps Dad is back by now. There's a train from New York at three o'clock. Let's hurry home and see.' But when the Hardy boys arrived home, they found that their father had not yet returned from the city. "'We'll just have to be patient, I guess,' said Frank. "'No news is good news.' And with this philosophic reflection, the Hardy boys were obliged to comfort themselves against the impatience that possessed them to learn what progress their father was making in the city toward following up the clues they had given him. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Tower Treasure by Franklin W. Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Days of Waiting Fenton Hardy had high hopes of a quick solution of the mystery when he went to New York. Possession of the wig, the hat, and the coat gave him three clues, any one of which might lead to tracing the previous owner quickly, and the detective was confident that it would not be long before he would unravel the tangled threads. He had not stated his optimism to the boys, being careful not to arouse their hopes, but in his heart he thought it would be but a matter of hours before he ran the owner of the red wig to earth. But obstacles presented themselves before him in bewildering succession. The wig appeared to be his chief clue, and when he arrived in the city he went directly to the head office of the company that had manufactured it. When he sent his card in to the manager, he was readily admitted, for Fenton Hardy's name was known from the Atlantic to the Pacific. "'Some of our customers in trouble, Mr. Hardy?' asked the manager when the great detective tossed the red wig in his desk. "'Not yet, but one of your customers will be in trouble if I can ever trace the purchaser of this wig.' The manager picked it up. He inspected it carefully and frowned. We are not, as you know, a wig-making firm, he said. That is, the wig department is a very small sideline with us. The very reason I thought it would be easier to trace this, replied Mr. Hardy. If you turned out thousands of them every year, it might be more difficult. You sell to an exclusive theatrical trade, I believe. Exactly. If an actor wants a wig of some special nature, we do our best to please him. We only make the wigs to order. Then you will probably have a record of this one. The manager turned the wig over in his hands, glanced carefully at the inside, felt of the weight and texture, then pressed a button at the side of his desk. A boy came and departed with a message. It may be difficult. The wig is not new. In fact, I would say it was turned out about two years ago. A long time, but still. I'll do the best I can. A bespectacled old man shuffled into the office at that moment in response to the manager's summons and stood waiting in front of the desk. Kaufman here, said the manager, is our expert. What he doesn't know about wigs isn't worth knowing. Then, turning to the old man, he handed him the red wig. Remember it, Kaufman? The old man looked at it doubtfully. Then he gazed at the ceiling. Red wig, red wig he muttered. About two years old, isn't it? prompted the manager. Not quite. Year and a half, I'd say. Looks like a comedy character type. Wait till I think. There ain't been so many of our customers playing that kind of a part inside a year and a half. Let's see, let's see. The old man paced up and down the office, muttering names under his breath. Suddenly he stopped, snapping his fingers. I have it, he said. It must have been Morley who bought that wig. That's who it was. Harold Morley. He is playing in Shakespearean repertoire with Hamlin's company. Very fussy about his wigs. Has to have them just so. I remember he bought this one because he came in here about a month ago and ordered another just like it. 
Why would he do that? asked Mr. Hardy. Kaufman shrugged his shoulders. Ain't none of my business. Lots of actors keep a double set of wigs. Morley's playing down at the Crescent Theatre right now. Call him up. I'll go and see him, said Mr. Hardy, rising. You're sure he is the man who ordered that wig? Positive, replied Kaufman, looking hurt. I know every wig that goes out my shop. I give em all my personal attention. Morley got the wig, and he got another like it a month ago, I remember. Kaufman is right, put in the manager. Morley has a very good account with us. If Kaufman says he remembers the wig, it must be so. Well, thank you for your trouble, answered Fenton Hardy. I may be able to see Mr. Morley in his dressing room if I hurry. It lacks about half an hour of theater time. You'll just about make it. Glad to have been of service, Mr. Hardy. Any time we can do anything for you, just ask. Thank you. And Fenton Hardy shook hands with Kaufman and the manager, then left the office, bound for the Crescent Theater. But the detective's hopes were not as high as they had been. He knew that Morley, the actor, was certainly not the man who had worn the wig on the day the roadster was stolen, for the Shakespearean company of which Morley was a member had been playing a three months run in New York. It would be impossible for the actor to get away from the theater long enough for such an escapade, just as it was improbable that he would even try to do so. He presented his card to a suspicious doorman at the Crescent, and was finally admitted backstage and shown down a brilliantly lighted corridor to the dressing room of Harold Morley. It was a snug little place, the dressing room, for Morley had fitted it up to suit his own tastes once it was assured that the company would remain at the Crescent for an extended run. There were pictures on the walls, a potted plant in the window overlooking the alleyway, and a rug on the floor. Seated before a mirror with electric lights at either side was a stout little man, almost totally bald. He was diligently rubbing cold cream on his face, and when Fenton Hardy entered he did not turn around, but eyeing his visitor in the mirror, casually told him to sit down. "'Often heard of you, Mr. Hardy,' he said in a surprisingly deep voice that had a comical effect in contrast to his diminutive appearance. "'Often heard of you. Glad to meet you.' What kind of call is this? Social or professional? Professional. Morley continued rubbing cold cream on his jowls. Spill it, he said briefly. What's it all about? Ever see this wig before? asked Mr. Hardy, tossing the red wig on the table. Morley turned from the mirror, and an expression of delight crossed his plump countenance. Well, I'll say I've seen it before, he declared. Old Kaufman, the best wig maker in the country, made that for me about a year and a half ago. That's the kind of wig I wear for Launcelot Gobbo and the Merchant of Venice. Where did you get it? I sure didn't think I'd ever see that wig again. Why? Stolen from me. Some low-down egg cleaned out my dressing room one night. During the performance. Nerviest thing I ever heard of. Came right in here while I was doing my stuff out front, grabbed my watch and money and a diamond ring I had lying by the mirror, took this wig and a couple of others that were lying around and beat it. Nobody saw him come or go. Must have got in by that window. Morley talked in short, rapid sentences, and there was no mistaking his sincerity. How many wigs did he take? About half a dozen. Funny thing about that, too. They were all red. Took nothing but red wigs. I told the cops to be on the lookout for a red-headed thief. I didn't worry so much about the other wigs, for there were for old plays, but this one was being used right along. Kaufman made it specifically for me. I had to get him to make another. But say, where did you find it? Oh, just a little case I'm investigating. The crook left this behind him. I was trying to trace it. Well, you've traced it all right, but that's all the help I can give you. The cops never did find out who cleaned out my dressing room. Mr. Hardy was disappointed. The clue of the red wig had led only to a blind alley, but he concealed his chagrin and tossed the wig over to Morley. "'Gee, and I'm sure glad to get it back again,' declared the actor. "'Things haven't gone right with me at all since I lost that wig. Losing it brought me a whole flock of bad luck. Sorry I can't help you find the guy that took it. What's he been up to now?' Fenton Hardy evaded the question. Oh, I'll probably get him some other way. Give me a list and description of the stuff he took from you. Probably I can trace him through that. Hop to it, 
said Morley breezily. Hop right to it, old man. Here's a list of the stuff right here. He reached in a drawer and drew out a sheet of paper which he handed over to the detective. That's the same list I gave to the cops when I reported the robbery, number of the watch and everything. Mr. Hardy folded the list and put it in his pocket. Morley glanced at his watch lying beside the mirror face up and gave an exclamation. Suffering Sebastopol! Curtain in five minutes and I'm not half made up yet. Excuse me, Mr. Hardy, but I've got to get busy, and this business I'll be ready in a minute doesn't go. He seized a stick of grease paint and feverishly resumed the task of altering his appearance to that of the character he was portraying at the matinee that day. Mr. Hardy, smiling at the actor's casual informality, withdrew from the dressing room and made his way out to the street. Blind alley, he muttered. I was sure I could trace that fellow by the means of the wig. Oh, well. He shrugged his shoulders. And if the worst comes to the worst, I can try to trace the chap through the stuff he stole from Morley, for it probably was the same man. But it looks like a big job. It was a big job. Efforts to trace the purchaser of the hat and coat were fruitless. The search ended at a second-hand store, where the owner vainly tried to sell Mr. Hardy a complete outfit of clothing at a bargain, but could not or would not remember who had bought the coat from him. He sold so many coats and at such bargains that he could not remember the customers who came into his store. Mr. Hardy was forced to retire, defeated. The predominating quality of the detective's character was patience. When he found that he could not trace the thief through the wig, the hat, or the coat, he doggedly set to work trying to trace the man who had broken into the dressing room of the actor, Morley, and this in spite of the fact that the police had already given up that case as hopeless. Then, in his spare time, Mr. Hardy spent hours at police headquarters, poring over records, searching for particulars of hundreds of red-headed criminals. It was over a week before he found what he wanted, and it came from a chance note at the bottom of a police description of a thief who was at that time out on parole. But when Fenton Hardy saw the note, he knew he had stumbled on the clue he needed, and he smiled grimly. It won't be long now, he remarked in the popular phrase of the day as he went back to his hotel. End of chapter 12